<laughs> well, glory to Jesus Christ. Today is January 11th, Monday. So if it's Monday, it must be the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And we had just finished uh, the section on prayer, which is uh, really great spiritual reading. Just, just to read it for spiritual reading. Is, is, is great, I think, anyway. But uh, now we move to the sacraments and to uh, other aspects of prayer. And part two, which in the forest green colored catechism of the Catholic Church, the second edition, the uh, large, large one, because there were different editions, there were different... Uh, formats of it, the small one, different things like that. And then there were, there was uh, the first edition also. So this is on page 277 in this part two, the celebration of the Christian mystery. This Christian mystery. So let's pray to the Holy Spirit because we have to rely on God, the Holy Spirit, in understanding anything about God and in experiencing anything about God and in the knowing, just in knowing in general. And so, because all is by grace, the touching of the natural by, by the supernatural, by grace, by God's energy, by God's undeserved favor, the sharing of his his very nature, as Second Peter one tells us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. And you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And another prayer to the Spirit in our the Devotions to the Holy Spirit by Father Brian Moore, S.J., published by the Daughters of St. Paul, the uh, Pauline Books and Media. For the gift of prayer, this is on page 46. Amen. Gift of the Father given in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit of God, Come into our hearts and teach us to say, Abba, Father. Teach us to proclaim, Jesus is Lord. Teach us to love God and to cling to him through you, Spirit of love, who has been poured into our hearts. And when our own prayers fail us, you who know the will of God, yourself, pray within us and for us. That's a prayer uh, inspired by Galatians 4. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 5 and 8. And this section is entitled The Celebration of the Christian Mystery. Now, mysterion, tall mysterion in Greek doesn't just mean the way we use it. In fact, it mostly doesn't. When we talk about a mystery, like, oh, I have many mysteries now, the older I get, trying to find things. I, know, I just had it in my hand, whatever it is, and I put it down, and it's nowhere to be seen. And it's enough to make you believe in leprechauns, that they come and steal things, or fairies, or whatever. But, no, it's my... Uh, my mind, which is all over the place, and more over, and more all, all over the place. The older I get, that or it's not, you know, a, a 
Miss Marple murder mystery or Murdoch mysteries or something like that. Uh, it's not a whodunit. It's not trying to uh, put uh, pieces onto a puzzle or, or figure out something like that. No, Mysterion means, uh, in many ways, mystical experience. And uh, mystic, uh, mustikos and mysterion are related words yeah. in Greek. But uh, it's, it's this experience, which often is not easily explained or able to be explained at all. It reminds me of a friend of mine at the monastery. His grandmother died, and she was very devout. And... He, and, and he has a dream, and there she is, and she looks great. She's young in this, and and he knows exactly who she is right off. And he says, oh, what's heaven like? And she smiles and lifts up, and then she starts, and she starts basically speaking in tongues. Blah, 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 blah. And it's a, he, he, she, it could not be really communicated well in words, which is why the... Anything about God is usually done by metaphor or analogy or, or the like to communicate that. When we, when we talk about the relation of the first person of the Trinity and the second person, we use the analogy of father and son because that is that can be one of the highest forms of love and devotion. Mother and daughter could be too, but let's not even go there. Uh, the uh, and that's the you know a biblical one. The New Testament used that because God was called Father uh, in the in the Hebrew Scriptures and in the Jewish tradition in the Oral Torah there. So <clears throat> so this is what is meant by the Christian mystery, and we say the mystery of faith. Uh, when we, uh, right after the words of institution, the consecration of the, the bread and the wine into the actual body and blood of Christ, but it's uh, a mystery in the sense that it's uh, not explainable. It's not, you know, we try to explain it. We use terms from philosophy, from Aristotelian philosophy, all this to explain the the real presence that this the, the the change which is a traditional word for it in, in the eastern liturgies they when they have the epiclesis they say you're changing them into the holy in, into the body and blood of christ or whatever changing them by the holy spirit again it's the holy spirit we always get back to the holy spirit if, if anything about experience anything about spiritual knowledge the Holy Spirit, that's that's his forte, it adheres to his personality. Not that the other two hypostases, the persons of the Trinity, aren't fully involved in everything else. They never act alone. They're always involved in each other. Which is why saying, refusing to say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and saying Creator, Redeemer, Sanctifier, uh, doesn't make it. Be, that's more modalistic. That uh, Instead of actual persons, actual uh, job descriptions, more like it. So in modalism, they say that Father, Son, Holy Spirit are just uh, different hats that the same person wears. But no, we say, no, God is internal, infinite love. God has to be, since God is the only being in eternity, the only eternal and infinite being, God has to be more than one person. Maybe you can put person in quotes, because we tend to think of person uh, uh, the way we think of each other, of human being. You think often you hear person, you just think of human being. And of course, we have that imagery for God, but we have to remember that's imagery, that God is infinitely transcending all of this. Yet, God has become fully human in Jesus. Without watering down his divinity, without mixture, without separation, God, the eternal word, becomes fully human. 
a man like us in all things but sin, as the book of Hebrews tells us. So, uh, there's, so there's another word here. We have, we have the word musterion. Now we have the word liturgia, or liturgia, or however you want to pronounce it. And that comes, that means a public work or a public thing. And it usually means a public, quote unquote, performance, a public worship, a public homage, a, a, a public action uh, in that sense. And it comes from the word uh, uh, ergon, which is work, and uh, a word for people as well, uh, which just passed out of my mind right now. Not demos, of course, but um, anyway, so it's a, a public a public work is uh, what that is. And in particular, it's the public work of the church. Now, it can be the public work and nobody else is there except the rest of the communion of saints. So, you know, when I celebrate the breviary alone, the office, the divine office, that is liturgy. And I often like to sing it, and so, and so therefore it's good that it's done behind closed doors, I suppose. Uh, but uh, with my monastic experience there, um, psalms are just meant to be sung, and hymns are meant to be sung. But anyway, now that my voice is getting worse, uh, Maybe I should recite things more, but if I'm alone, okay. But, and if there's nobody else, like what here, at the, the mass, at the services, is all there is but me, and uh, the CD set from the uh, Adoramus hymnal, because they're the only ones that don't uh, mute out uh, a, a something from a CD, it seems. Well, liturgy. So if I'm alone there doing the liturgy, I'm not alone. Because we've talked about this before in the prayer. You never pray alone. We're always with the entire communion of saints. Not just the people in heaven, not just the angels and, and uh, the people who've gone before us and are totally transformed now, but also those on the porch of heaven, those... Uh, and their their stages of purgation after death, and uh, which is a doctrine that always made much more sense to me than hell. Although, don't think I don't believe in hell. I do. The more I experience uh, some people, the more I think that there really is final impenitence. That there really is. There are people who will really would choose. To be alienated from God forever, rather than submit to God, uh, or, or or be changed to be transformed. Uh, it, it's, I hope the number is few, but the older I get, the more experience I have, the more I see that. Also, the saints, more and more saints. So there have been so many saints in my life, and uh, and not just people, you know, that you call that happen to be pious or something, or people in the, having the seed of sainthood, but people in full flower. And usually obscure people, people often not uh, talked about by others, and they'll never be canonized because, uh, you know, in two generations, no one will remember them at all. And But God does. So we're praying with them. We're praying with the saints. We're praying with the saints in purgatory because they're totally saved, but they're just being spruced up, and some of them need a bit more work than others, uh, that, uh, and it's trans-temporal and uh, not spatial, because there are no bodies involved or whatever. So that's, uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of imagery of purgatory, but uh, especially non-Catholics tend to take it, take them as literal. Uh, anyway. So liturgy. So the liturgy is, but a, a public work of private prayer, let's say uh, 10,000 people get together to say the rosary, which I'm all for, the rosary, I, 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 the 
the more I do it, the more I get uh, out of it, I must say. Um, and uh, but that's not public prayer. That's not liturgy. Liturgy is specific thing by the church that says this is liturgy, that this is it. And there are different liturgies of the different rites, the different uh, churches within the church, the different traditions within the church. Include, uh, and so, uh, you know, we now have an Anglican use uh, coming out of the Oxford movement in the 19th century, the Anglo-Catholic uh, movement and uh, churchmanship in uh, the Anglican communion. Uh, from that, people, uh, uh, many said, well, the, really the goal of Anglo-Catholicism is reunion with uh, the Catholic Church on the continent, uh, not to be uh, just a national church, but to be part of it. So uh, we there are, there's an Anglican use that uh, draws from much of the Anglo-Catholic tradition, from the Books of Common Prayer, the very books of common prayer and all that, and uh, also from Vatican II and stuff like that, and it's uh, uh, the Tridentine, which we got from Anglo Catholicism. But uh, so there's that, there's that right, and there, you know, when they they have their their office, morning and evening prayer, morning song, uh, even song, uh, they have uh, they have all that. They have they have the mass, they have their own calendar. Uh, they have all this. And this is true of all the rites of the church. What are called rites, which we have to vote to put in, because it emphasizes this, the, the uh, liturgical uh, action and, and the prayer, the set prayer. And also the traditions, what is called para-liturgical, para-liturgies, about, around the liturgy. So... Um, a lot of home rituals, according to your, your rites, they're not liturgy, but they often draw from it. But say Advent wreaths or, or things like that, or different prayers, novenas, different things. They can be uh, par they par can be paraliturgical, and some actually are patterned on on liturgical things. And then we have uh, like then you have like the little office and stuff like that, which are which would be, I suppose, liturgy because it's an abridgment often of of a breviary office and stuff like that. so there are all these and the diff, all different rites all the different eastern rites and there are other western rites and there used to be more of them before uh, uh, Charlemagne and certainly before uh, the French Revolution uh, such as the Gallican uh, which is sort of amorphous I suppose that seem to have been different almost everywhere. Uh, uh, Celtic, which some think of as a branch of, of Gallican, but uh, there are all these different different ones that we don't have. And there were those who think these should really be revived. And uh, uh, I think in some of the old Catholic churches and the old Orthodox churches, they have been revived. The Sarum use. There, there were uses as well. That's a subset of a rite. Um, the recension. Then um, so we have that the Mos the we have the Mozarabic in Spain very interesting, uh, very different uh, in many ways from uh, the mass that we have, uh, but uh, you can see basic some basic similarities there. And it was in Latin, but the, but the epistle was in Arabic, and this was in Spain, mind you, and uh, it used to be the dominant right in Spain. Then uh, in the Diocese of Milan, there still is the Milanese rite, the Ambrosian rite, which had its uh, transformation at, at Vatican II, uh, not always to have the effect, as some would say, uh, according to some people's view. But, uh, and then a, a different religious orders often have their own use. So they're Carmelite, Carthusian, Dominican, You'd have that, which is usually would have been the uh, the papal right or papal use right, or the right in a particular location at a particular time, and so it might not have the prayers of the faith, or a prayer prayers at the foot of the altar or whatever, 
the uh, their penitential rite might be different, or things could be different. So there are these different, so these different liturgies, uh, liturgical families. And uh, so, of course, the heart of the liturgy is the Mass, the Eucharist. And then there were the sacraments, which are also liturgy, because they're meant to be done publicly for the most part. But if it's just me anointing someone in a nursing home and it's just the person there, that's liturgy as well. So um, the same to confession. Confession is liturgy. It's just between two people and God. Uh, it's liturgy. So uh, as a set, although it's a looser <coughs> liturgy than, let's say, the Mass would be, which has set rubrics, set things for that, uh, liturgical law, as they say, which uh, can go into another time. So some think this that's all adiaphora and a lot of this stuff is uh, uh, adiaphora are uh, things that are good, but they're not necessary. So some people would say that, like art, some people would say that. Others would say, no, no, art is essential. And all this. So uh, again, I digress. 1066, the Battle of Hastings. Well, that's the paragraph that is on, that we're on here on page uh, 277, part two, the celebration of the Christian liturgy. Why the liturgy? This isn't just saying what the liturgy, but why the liturgy? Why not just private prayer? Why, it, you say, well, didn't Jesus say, go into your little room uh, by yourself and talk to God? Like, yes, he did. And that's an important aspect of prayer. But it's not all there is. Jesus participated in the liturgy of the Jewish church at that time. And uh, they, you know, he went on pilgrimage, he went to the temple sacrifices, he went to synagogue services, he you know, celebrated the festivals with their uh, liturgical things like processions and stuff like that. He was involved in all of that. And then, of course, the early church had its own liturgy, in, which would have been in, uh, a, basic, a basic, but different in all these different places, according to the culture, the place, the uh, the way it forms, the authors, etc. So 1066, in the symbol of the faith. So now we have another Greek word that doesn't necessarily mean what we mean when we use it. When we use symbol, we use it, it, it's something that stands for something, but it doesn't contain what it stands for. That's usually the thing. But uh, a symbol or symbolon can be something that communicates something. It can be what is called a natural sign. So you see a cloud in the sky. And what does that, quote unquote, symbolize? Something that contains water, rain. And it, may, it might not rain, but uh, there's water there. And... Uh, you know, where there's smoke, this fire, you've heard that. Not that the smoke contains the fire, but the, sort of, sort of the fire sort of contains the smoke. Uh, so those are natural signs. And then we have arbitrary signs, which is we agree that this means something. An example of that is an alphabet. Now we agree that this letter that sort of looks like uh, a tent on, on poles, uh, that's an alpha. And it has the sound ah, or the letter a, and it has that sound. Or it can have. We can also agree that it can have other signs, in, sounds in different circumstances, connected with other letters. But that's arbitrary. There's nothing innate about uh, ah, ahness with that letter. It's it's agreed upon, or a literal sign, a street sign. So we say, and so uh, <coughs> you have a sign that's an arrow pointing. So <coughs> that you could, you don't need a degree to figure out what that means. Uh, this direction, and it says the name of this town, and that's in that direction. So you know that that, or things that are arbitrary, like a uh, a stop sign 
or, or you know, the circle with the, the line through it or something like that, or um, a colors to symbols, like red, you know, the traffic lights. Red, you stop. Yellow, you proceed with caution. Green, you can go. And the green arrow means you can go in the direction that the arrow points to. These are arbitrary. We agree on that. So let's say, you know, green can mean different things. And in Ireland, it means Catholicism, as it does in, in the, on the Irish flag. And in the Italian flag, it means Catholicism. But uh, in the Indian flag, it means Islam. And green often is a color of Islam in some other places. And, uh, and, and the Irish flag, orange, stands for Protestantism. And in the Hindu flag, orange, I mean the Indian flag, rather, it stands for Hinduism. And white stands for peace, but it could also mean surrender. Waving the white, a white cloth means you surrender. Those are arbitrary things. Those are arbitrary signs. And sacraments are arbitrary signs that contain natural signs. And we'll get into that later. The Eucharist, for example. The Eucharist is what it stands for. The Eucharist is Jesus Christ. But the, it's the, the container is a sign that is would be an arbitrary sign that Jesus picked. Jesus picked bread and said, this is my body. He could have picked uh, an almond joy and said, this is my body. No, he picked bread, the, what uh, the Latin church believes it was the uh, unleavened bread, the, the matzah that he used at that. He picked that up. And the wine, and you can see the wine as a symbol for blood, red wine anyway, the dark wine, because it can be a blood colored or something like that. Uh, which is one of the reasons I always prefer to use a dark wine rather than a, a white wine at the Eucharist. And I was in one church, they used a, a, it was a yellow wine. It tasted good too. But when you bring it up in the cruet, I don't want to say what it looks like. But anyway, so uh, back to this, back to a symbol a symbol on toss symbol on and uh so we talk so a word can be like this a word communicating this a word can be communicating something and a bunch of words can communicate something so so the creed is often called the symbol of faith so uh, yes of course when we're communicating the words communicating this experience, this reality, divine realities, uh, it always is really inadequate. As St. Thomas Aquinas said, after having this great experience, this mystical experience of Christ, he said about all his works that they were all straw. Now they're gold, uh, really, and stuff like that. And he wasn't disparaging his work, but compared to the, the experience of God, this, it just doesn't communicate it. So it's like trying to describe uh, someone to someone. And let's say uh, you want someone to paint a picture of someone uh, that you loved uh, that's deceased now, but you don't have any pictures. So you have to photo. So you have to describe it. So the person does. And then you look at it and say, well, not really. Sort of. You get that. So the symbol of faith, the creed, the, and, and the symbol of faith is the Nicene Creed. And you can also use them for the other creeds. Uh, but uh, that's it. So the symbol of the faith, in the symbol of the faith, the, that's the Nicene Creed here. This We're at 1066 now. The church confesses the mystery of the Holy Trinity and the plan of God's good pleasure for all creation. For, for salvation, for uh, his, the plan of God for us. What is the plan of God for us? To be united with him fully, forever. Not absorbed into him. That's a different uh, uh, religious and philosophical system 
It's called pantheism. Uh, so we don't get absorbed into God. We come into total communion with God. So there is absolutely no separation. So this distinction, but no separation, is sort of a pale reflection of the reality of the Trinity in which this distinction, but no separation. But uh, for us, there is, we will be not just a distinct persons, but we're going to be distinct beings. We're going to be beings. We're still going to be other, even though we're going to be totally united. And that, that again, talking about these realities of God, words are difficult. And, and with the Trinity in a special way, it becomes very difficult. So when you talk to people who the uh, radical monotheists, our fellow monotheists, because Trinitarians are just as monotheistic as uh, uh, non-Christian Jews and non-Christian Muslims, and, or Baha'is or whatever, people who are, are radical along with us, because we believe we are radically monotheist. Monotheistic means one God. One God with a capital G, that's that. But we have within God the this community, but it's absolutely one being. And so you can see sort of the a, 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 a glaze go over the eyes of non-Christians, and even Christians, <clears throat> because there are people who've tried to, uh, you know, claiming that they're being truly New Testamentic or whatever, and get rid of that. I mentioned modalism before. That's one way of saying, oh, these are just different uh, titles for the one person of God. So uh, uh, that was also called patropassianism, which comes from the Greek, uh, the father suffered and on the cross. It's also from the Latin, too. Uh, the uh, he suffered on the cross. No, no, me, no, 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 no. It was the Son in His humanity that suffered on the cross. The Father doesn't have humanity. The Father didn't suffer on the cross. Uh, the Father has no body. Uh, the Holy Spirit has no body. The Son has a body since the moment of His conception. But there's the distinction there in natures, and that's another thing that often clouds over. So often I try to talk with Muslims and they say, well, how can you believe that God uh, slept? If God slept, the whole universe would go away. Or that God died. How could God, uh, the, no, 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 no. God, quote, unquote, died in the human nature and body of Jesus. And Jesus is God, the eternal word incarnate. And then their eyes glaze over again with that. And, and so you explain that. I don't know how often I have explained this. And then the same person will come up with this, say, well, how can you believe that God had to go to the bathroom on how, how God can eat? And all that? No, it's the humanity, the body. There's a distinction, distinct natures, distinct nature of the divine, distinct nature of human, but one person. And their eyes glaze over and even if you, know, you draw diagrams, you do all this stuff, which makes perfect sense to me, but they don't get it. So in some ways, I think you need grace, I think, to get this. But uh, so anyway, the Holy Trinity, especially. God is eternal love, has to be more than one person to be eternal love, because love is relationship, etc. Et so, but why three? Why not... Uh, an, an, innumerable, an innumerable a number of uh, persons in God, uh, each with his own person, uh, stuff like that. So, uh, and maybe in forms of Hinduism that makes sense. Uh, but of course, Hinduism actually doesn't have true distinction. It, uh, anything you, I heard a professor once said, anything you say about Hinduism or Buddhism is true, but it's probably also false with some. Uh, some group or something like that, or some or some perspective or something like that. Anyway, and uh, their their stuff might be even more complicated than ours, uh, because God is ultimately simple. And you say, well, if God is ultimately simple, how can He be 
a community? How can you be three persons? Well, why three persons? Revelation. Jesus said, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then if you go through the scripture reading in the apostolic tradition, you find this. You find the person, a very active person, of God the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, for example. No, other things like that. So this is this the symbol of faith. We confess the mystery of the Trinity. So mystery not as a problem. The tr Trinity is not a problem. The Trinity is uh, so magnificent, uh, so uh, so wonderful. But three, we have three because that was revealed as three. God was revealed as absolutely one in being, essence, substance, etc. One in nature but distinct, not separated in persons or hypostases and stuff like that. So, so uh, and a lot of this language isn't in the Bible. So Bible alone really doesn't take you all that far. And not that in a literal sense, anyone goes by the Bible. Everyone reads the Bible through a particular lens, through a particular experience, through a particular instruction through particular, quote-unquote, insights that aren't in the Bible. Uh, or they put things together there that uh, other people say, how did you do that? We don't see how you did So that's why with Bible alone, you have these thousands and thousands of different uh, doctrinal positions that are not compatible. And even divisions, you know, to uh, uh, groups that uh, anathemize each other at all. Uh, of course, uh, Catholics have, are, are quite able to be quite contentious also, and also they, they say, well, you know, my opinion on this is dogma. Well, your opinion probably isn't dogma. Dogmas, the dogmas that are defined by the church, they are dogmas. The doctrines of the church, they are doctrines. You may have sentencia pia, pious opinions on such. They may be learned pious opinions. They may be ultra pious opinions, and they're you're intended to glorify God and everything. But that's often what they are. So, and yes, something that seems to start off as a pious opinion can uh, the this person's interpretation of scripture or or and or tradition uh, can you know result in in a dogma like the. Immaculate conception, let's say, or something. So, uh, but uh, I digress. So, it's God's good pleasure. God's good pleasure is our salvation. God's good pleasure is not our damnation. God doesn't want us damned. With uh, all due respect to uh, uh, radical tulipist Calvinism, God doesn't want anybody damned. God does not will anyone be damned. This is what they say, the permissive will. If God says, okay, you're determined to uh, run from me from all eternity, and it will be greater torture for you to be uh, in a full presence, although, you know, in sin, we cannot really experience the full presence of God, uh, I let you go. Because that, that's permissive will of God. And then the permissive will, why does God permit all these terrible things to happen? to innocent people, a baby born with some genetic disease, so totally innocent, and having that, all this stuff. Although some of the counselors say, oh no, not innocent, we're all guilty. But, uh, oh, here we go. But, um, God is there for us. We are, Salvation is his good pleasure. The Father accomplishes the mystery of his will, in quotes. By giving his beloved Son and his Holy Spirit for the salvation of the world and the glory of his name. So we've got the, the Son, is, but the Holy Spirit is also a crucial role in this. The Father, too. Because as I said, the Trinity never acts in separation. The glory of his name. But this isn't an uh, act of, of divine egotism that he has to blow his own trumpet. Uh, but of course, among us, if you don't blow your own horn, who's going to do it? But anyway, uh, no, God 
our experience of the glory of God, glorifying God, is for our sake, not for his. God doesn't need, God didn't need to create the universe. He did that in an overflow of his love. He doesn't need us, quote unquote. But he will not act without us in so many things. As St. Augustine said, he who uh, created us without our consent will not save us without our consent. He who made us without our participation will not save us without our participation. And yes, we're saved by grace alone, but it's grace that is paradoxically all that saves us, yet it's never really alone. It's always uh, connected to the virtues. It's always manifesting in the virtues. It's always there. You know, that's like faith and works. They're not, it's not either or. The works have to flow out of the faith. The works are the, are the evidence of the faith. And the works build up the faith. So fake it till you make it, as they say in AA, uh, about acting something. Because I believe this. I believe the promises of God. So I'm going to act on this. So the, uh, the faith has its works, as does love and hope. And faith, the virtue of faith is... First of all, the grace of God, as all virtues are, but then it's a cooperation on our part. And uh, in Latin, that comes from opera works, a con, uh, con operatis, is it? Yeah. And uh, with works. So you work with somebody. I'm working with somebody that's cooperating. So we're working with God. And without God, it's nothing. Nothing is accomplished. It starts with God. It continues with God, and it it is fi finished with God. It's matured with God, in God, by God, through God. Uh, it's all grace. So, so such is the mystery of Christ. Again, that that word is going to come up a lot, and it's already come up even in the prayer section the, it, with again not a whodunit but this uh, experience should we say revealed and fulfilled in history so our faith isn't uh, it's historical it's not a cyclic thing it's not a uh, one of myth in the sense of something ahistorical and all that it, it, this actually didn't happen or this actually these characters never really existed and this and that and that and never happened we have that in scripture and all this other stuff but that our faith isn't based on our faith is historical so it's based on uh muthos that's another that where myth comes from as uh Again, the communication of truth through uh, means the, 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 the utter relation of facts fails. Uh, so, uh, and as C.S. Lewis said, uh, Christ is the myth that was real, the myth that is true, the myth that's a fact. So, uh, but... Uh, Our thing is history. So it comes through history. Salvation history. So it's a God acting through the human. And it's not on a, a cycle so that you know it's not all going to all repeat over again. So that's one of the reasons Christians, we don't have reincarnation. We don't have to be recycled. And let me tell you, I think once is enough through this mortal life. Um, uh, in fact, in, in the Eastern traditions that have uh, uh, metempsychosis, metempsychosis, the uh, the uh, reincarnation, your your soul or, or your whatever your is uh, recycled and born again. That's not a positive thing. You don't. You want to get to the point where that stops. You want nirvana. You want that to stop. No more reincarnation. No more incarnation, because it means 
not just being born again in pain, but uh, all the pains and all the struggles and all the humiliations and all the of things of life you have to do, go through, all the hungers and thirsts and all that. And then you die again. And then in, in these traditions, it's over and over and over and over and over, many thousands, maybe millions of times. And maybe not even a, come back as a human, you might come back as an aardvark, you might come back as a whatever, because of the, the continuum of this and the, the unity of uh, all reality. Again, in pantheism, that's also what you get. But also, in in many of these, it's not the, the uh, nature and everything isn't the summation of the of the ultimate. Uh, but the ultimate is actually uh, even infinitely infinitely beyond that as well. And there are different forms. There are different forms. There are different. You know, there will be different things. So no, uh, this is. Uh, and uh, this, I'm being simple. Uh, trying to be simple here. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's more involved than than that, and uh, and actually quite uh, you can see, see it has quite reasonable in, 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 in it has its points, but we don't go there because uh, we are not we're not a, a whole cyclic thing. We're linear in that that. Uh, uh, and in life, you know, your life, you die, heaven or hell, ultimately, that's, that's that. Not, you know, go through that, and then you get recycled again, and all of this stuff, and over and over and over. No, we don't have that. But, and it's historical. It's not for nothing that in the creed, in the, both the Apostles and the Nicene Creed, and I say the creed, it's the Nicene Constantinopolitan. It mentions Pontius Pilate. And as a child, when I was first hearing this, I heard it early on. I, I don't, it, uh, we'd be playing Cardinal Cushion Say in the Rosary. So I knew the, I knew the prayers of the Rosary before I went into, into uh, the first grade, you know, from that. But I didn't know what they meant. They were, you know, it was Hail Mary full of grapes and, the Lord is a tree, and our Father who art in heaven, uh, Harold be thy name, stuff like that. Uh, deliver us from eagles. But in the, uh, the creed, I thought Jesus, he, Christ, suffered under a bunch of violets instead of suffered under Pontius Pilate. Because that's what it sounds like to me. But, um, uh, which I thought were lilacs, but that's another story. The, uh, but that historical thing, and, and it's been shown, you know, we, we have uh, a, uh, an inscription for him in Caesarea, his seat, and he had in the amphitheater in Caesarea, uh, and that was not, and, and they had the, uh, the location and everything when it was found, so it wasn't uh, uh, something that someone dug up an old stone, someone dug up and carved this on it and made it to look old. Uh, so... A historical, so it's how the history. God came down and plunged himself into our mess, into taking the fullness of our nature and involving also the reality of history. Every man is a history. It's a, it was a, a bio, autobiography of a, a Ukrainian Catholic priest that I had read, uh, and that was the title of it. Uh, he was during the communist period towards the end uh, uh, he had been an, an orthodox priest but he was secretly Greek Catholic uh, which was illegal to be uh, he, uh, Greek Orthodox uh, uh, Russian Orthodox at that point uh, but uh, uh, when when he came out they he was arrested and all that and he was sent to uh, Chernobyl after the thing hoping that he would uh, not live through that, but he did. Uh, I hope he's still alive. Maybe he died, did die of cancer from that. Uh, I don't know. I can't remember his name either. But that was the book. Uh, Every man is a history, and it's true. We all have our history. And I remember uh, reading a book, a history book, when I was in the 
the eighth grade, and it, it said, history is his story, man's story, humanity's story. And, but also each person has his or her own story to tell, his or her own experience and all that. And so the, our faith, the Christian faith, along with the Jewish and the Muslim faith, are historical. The Abraham faiths are historical. There's historical revelation, there are historical figures in this, and, uh, and so much depends on their historicity, especially in Christianity. You might be able to say, well, if it turned out there was never really a, a Moses, well, the revelation could still be going and you could still have all that. And if it turned out there never really was a Muhammad or something, which is, you know, it's, Muhammad is provable, basically. <coughs> uh, that Islam could still go on. And of course, if there were no Buddha, uh, uh, Gautama Siddhartha Sakyamuni, uh, or whoever, whatever order those names go in, uh, if he never existed, as long as the, the, uh, the uh, Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the Five Precepts, etc., etc. As long as you, that's still there, you have it. But not so with Christianity. Without a literal Jesus Christ, and as actual God incarnate, and without you know Mary and all the, all these uh, actual historical people in that, in in uh, in in Jesus then uh, the whole thing is, uh, you know, we can still have, you can still have the ethics with all this other stuff, uh, but the, uh, the rest of it is blasted. There's like people who uh, uh, say there can't be any miracles and then say they're Christian. And I said, well, uh, you're a Trinitarian Christian? Yes, I said, well, what about the incarnation? The miracle of the virgin birth, let's say, oh, that wasn't a virgin birth. Said, well, what about the miracle, even if you don't accept that, which is dogma, if, if you don't accept that, uh, the miracle of that Jesus is God. What about that? And of course, if they don't accept that, then I said, okay, well, you're outside of the creedal Christianity or something else. And... Um, and, and the bodily resurrection of some people. Oh no, we, you know that that's just uh, that's just an allegory of something. And and it was just uh, the disciples uh, saw this, or they made it all up after one. But to uh, have this truth that Jesus lives on, and all this stuff. And, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, as uh, as we see that it's. The, the the Christian faith is is based on miracles. So and there are people who are what they call uh, cessationists that they believe miracles stopped after the early church. And that's you know God doesn't pull back his gift. Why would He give this gift before? That makes absolutely no sense. And uh, and they said that if you aren't willing to believe in miracles, well it's it's not surprising that you. Ex that uh, people in those theologies seem to experience so few. But uh, God is true to his word, and he is there. Such is the mystery of Christ, revealed and fulfilled in history according to the wisely ordered plan that St. Paul calls the plan of the mystery, in Ephesians 3 9. See also Ephesians 3 4. And the patristic tradition, that's the fathers of the church. The, for the uh, different scholars have different cutoff dates for the patristic period. It comes from the Greek word for father, uh, which is also just about the Latin word for father, and uh, the fathers of the church. There were also mothers of the church, especially uh, uh, the, the desert mothers, the desert fathers, the Amma. Uh, uh, we have Abba and we have Amma. We have uh, Daddy and we have Mommy. 
in, in the spiritual spiritual life there and uh, of uh, that and uh, you know we have sayings from the desert mothers as well as the desert fathers who lived where in a desert in deserts although uh, uh, some probably worked in forests and other things like that but in, in deserted area they tended to uh, not to plunge themselves into them not all of them but many but fathers of the church that's another story uh, but they're uh, people who uh, helped refine and shape and advance the development of doctrine and to articulate articulate uh, the apostolic tradition and, and to interpret scripture uh, in that way but uh, a father is not infallible in himself it's only the consensus part from the consensus that would be uh, that and uh, <clears throat> and like the Pope they have no claim to authority let alone infallibility to things that are outside the sphere of faith and morals there's a pretty good consensus among a lot of the early fathers of the church that laughing, especially laugh, as we would say in Boston, is, uh, uh, you know, shoulder-shaking laughter and all this stuff, which I agree is the best medicine, um, that, uh, that was bad for you. And they got that from uh, the medicine and uh, uh, medical theories, which were wrong, uh, and, f and from philosophies and stuff like that around at the time. So uh, and even if they absolutely all agreed on it, it wouldn't make it right. And it, it, it wouldn't make it authoritative because that's not their field. That's, uh, that's part of a magisterium that's not theirs, uh, a teaching, uh, teaching expertise, shall we say. Uh, that isn't theirs. It's in faith and morals, and then again, it's the consensus and all that. It, it, it especially is articulated in the councils of church, etc. So, the patristic tradition, coming at the the uh, again, it, some would put it up to the year thousand, and some. Say well, basically, some Eastern Orthodox where well, really the patristic tradition has never really ended. The uh, monastic fathers of uh, like uh, uh, Saint Pasius or some there are uh, the uh, you know the authors of the uh, the Philokalia and of the uh, authors that still that's still there now. Of course, the Philokalia, much of it is. In, in the what we in the West we call the Patristic period, but uh, the uh, doesn't uh, it, it they say it doesn't end. It's still going, go ongoing. I remember uh, someone I know. He was uh, Eastern Catholic, and someone asked, "Who's your favorite contemporary theologian?" And he said, "Oh, Saint Athanasius." Who lived in the fourth century? And he said, Saint Athanasius. He said, No, contemporary. He said, Well, he's contemporary to me. He's uh, he's not dead. So um, we're called into that, into so into this patristic tradition, tradition paradosis, the handing down or the handing over, and oral. The oral tradition with a capital T is uh, the living. And it, in a sense, is what makes the written word really living. As also, of course, what makes both of them really living, the Holy Spirit. So there's a unity of scripture, tradition, and the church. It's not scripture or tradition. It's not tradition or the church. It's not scripture or the church. It's a, they're all together. Because scripture comes out of the tradition, it's developed out of the tradition, and uh, and a scripture developed out of the church first, the Israelite church, and then the Christian church, the Catholic, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, out of that, and 
the one holy Catholic and apostolic church is the guardian and the interpreter of this. So, of course, that brings up a lot of controversy. What does one holy Catholic and apostolic church mean? What is that exactly? Because we as Catholics say, well, it's the papal Catholic communion. That's what it is. Not that the others aren't in real, if uh, not complete communion with the church. And not that the church has all the answers about everything, Catholic church. And not that we can't learn a great deal from them, from the other churches, and, and just about everything. Because often they will take an aspect of the Catholic tradition and really polish it and refine it and practice it better than, than we're doing. We've often we sometimes toss some things into the attic of, of the church. Uh, and, uh, well, often these others have really used it <coughs> to great advantage. But of course, it can be to disadvantage. You take scripture, for example. Often when uh, scripture was not, scripture has always been valued. And, then, and when they say, oh, well, the, uh, the uh, monastics and, and scholars of the Middle Ages didn't read the scriptures, they read the scriptures. They poured through the scriptures. Most of the things are, are commentaries on scriptures in one way or the other. But often, uh, it didn't become a real practice for, for lay people in particular. One of the fears was that people would interpret themselves and then go off in these 10,000 directions away from the church or come up with the wildest thing or, or, or whatever uh, in their, their private interpretation. So, uh, that, so we always interpret in the church, through the church, with the church. That's the Catholic position. So, uh, anyway, the patristic tradition we'll call the economy of the word incarnate. Again, we get the word economia, another Greek word that doesn't here just mean what we would mean by economy. <coughs> it's not just an issue of finances or of home management or of administration or something. This is the law of the house. The house of the faith. So this is uh, often acting in greater mercy rather than with akribia, with uh, uh, total strictness on something. But here it means the plan of the mystery, the economy of the word incarnate. This is God acting outside himself. So that uh, God acting outside himself uh, with us. The economy of the word incarnate, or the economy of salvation. So we'll start. We only did one paragraph today, but we got a lot out of it. Well, I did anyway. So there we are. So we'll continue with paragraph 1067 next week, inshallah, God willing, that I'm still around and you're still around, because we never know. We should always be ready. We should always, as Pope John the Twenty Third said, have your bag packed. Be ready to meet Jesus face to face. So let's pray the Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. There we go. There we go. So, uh, let's wave back. Maureen Tibbetts is waving. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Uh, no, Maureen, I can't see you. That's, uh, that's all right. Uh, Judy Walling, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Uh, is Christ in the Holy Trinity with the Father and the Spirit? Yes, that's the Holy Trinity. Well, no, each person is distinct. 
Is Christ the Holy Trinity with the Father and the Spirit or the Father and the Son who are one with the Trinity in the Spirit? So the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, that's the Trinity. It means three in one. So that's what the Trinity means there. Okay, have a great day, everybody. Bye now.